Okay. Can everybody see me okay? Should I put on, turn on the light or am I, you know, bathed in darkness? You're fine. Can you see me okay? Alexandra, do I look all right? I can't tell in this like tiny little screen. Um, yes, you're, you're fine. Pause okay, me. good. All right. Um, okay, so I'm, we're going to get started. Um, all right, well, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Fatima Argan, and I am the Outreach Vice Chair for the Interfaith Caucus that is organizing the event tonight. Um, the event, uh, the name of our event is Election 2020, Voter Suppression and Empowering Voters. Um, here we have, uh... <laughs> okay, so, um, First of all, I'm going to explain, uh, kind of go through a real quick overview um, of, of our outreach committee structure and, and our mission. And um, the outreach, uh, the Interfaith Caucus mission, um, what's our mission? Who are we and what, what do we do? So as a vital part of the outreach family of the Arlington County Democratic Committee, more familiarly known as Arlington Dems, we foster dialogue and engagement with Arlington and other faith communities in the DMV to ensure they are recognized, valued, and supported, and in turn facilitate mutual support and respect and drive informed, progressive, and inclusive policies. So um, I want to start by uh, introducing the members of my incredible uh, uh, Interfaith Caucus planning team members. Um, there's myself, obviously, as the chair, uh, vice chair, um, Alexandra Ritchie, who will um, be, uh, you know, doing the slides this evening. Uh, Ken Spiker, Anika Rothman, Michael Shea. Um, these guys are the core members of my planning team, and they'll be assisting me uh, tonight with questions in the chat box and helping to administer the polls that will invite the audience to participate in, and um, they'll also be helping me moderate tonight's forum. So um, at last count, uh, we, we also have a Facebook group. Um, at last count, we had 201 members, which is pretty good since we started the page back in April. So, you know, just for a couple of months time, um, that's, you know, the ramp up to 201 is pretty good. Um, going into, let's go into the purpose and objectives. Next slide, please. Okay, so the purpose and objectives of tonight's meeting, like why are we here? Why did we select the topic of voter suppression and voter empowerment? Well, we did this because it, it was in response to a post-event feedback form from a June 20th caucus event and considering the dire need to turn out the vote in favor of Democrats and democracy this fall, the Interfaith Caucus prioritized voter suppression and voter education as the next topic for its issues-based forum. So what are our objectives for this event? Well, the objective is to provide voters and volunteers in Arlington and Northern Virginia with timely and precise information about voting in Arlington and how they can volunteer and educate other voters here and beyond Arlington, including our core constituency, of course, which is faith communities. Finally, we want to engage the audience in conversation uh, about their recent experiences. This is intended to be a highly interactive uh, event. So, um, you know, don't let the slides scare you. We've got a, quite a few and the presentations will be very robust, but uh, so as you know, so will the discussion. So be, so, um, you know, be prepared for that and come with your questions. So uh, as I said, we want to engage the audience in conversation about their recent experiences voting and or volunteering so we can identify issues and highlight best practices going forward. Okay, lastly, what areas are we going to be focusing on? Um, Got to go back to the last slide. Okay, um, so I'll be introducing um, a brief, I'll be introducing our speakers by providing a brief biography, each of, of them. 
Um, all of our speakers are Northern Virginia Democratic volunteers and voter education protection uh, slash protection experts who will present on voter registration, early voting in person, voting absentee by mail, and voter protection and poll greeting. And this is all to ensure smooth operations on election day. Each speaker will review procedures, highlight any that are new, key dates, deadlines, and ways to volunteer and take action. So as I said, I'll be assisted by my incredible caucus planning team who will initiate the Q&A section and assist me in moderating the discussion with speakers based on questions submitted in advance via chat or via raised hand. And this is where we come to the uh, practical aspects of the event. Um, on, on the, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Zoom, you'll see a bunch of commands um, on the center bottom of your screen. Um, one of which is participants. I think it's the participant one. Yes. Um, so you hit the participant one, there's an arrow next to it, and that will allow you to raise your hand and or um, respond to questions. Uh, I don't think we'll have any on this one that will require um, a yes or no answer. And uh, you'll see a polling uh, a little uh, graph, you know, graphic uh, of, of a graph uh, showing the polling. And I think uh, Alexandra will probably provide a little more information once we get to that part in the program. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I'm going to ask everyone to please mute themselves um, just as a courtesy to everybody else uh, on the call so that we can um, you know, reduce background noise and allow people to hear uh, the speakers as, as much as possible. And I think that's it pretty much. Um, if I've missed anything, I'm sure I'll come back to it in the rest of the program. So, um, and finally, uh, we'll be adding, I just uh, want to finish the format part of it. We'll be, um, just so you'll know what to expect, we'll be inviting audience members to complete an event feedback survey in Google Forms. Uh, this link will be shared in the slides and will be sent to event participants by email as well. So with that, I'm going to go forward. Uh, we're going to, uh, in the speaker presentations, I'm going to introduce each speaker individually, um, all, well, all at once, and then um, they will, uh, you know, they'll speak after that. So um, I'm going to start with Matt Weinstein. Um, Matt, uh, Matt Weinstein is the current vice chair of the Arlington Electoral Board. Matthew is a land use attorney for McGuire Woods LLP with a practice area focusing on Northern Virginia real estate development. Matt previously served as senior staff on multiple statewide campaigns in Virginia, chief of staff for a member of the House of Delegates leadership, and worked in the U.S. Senate throughout law school. Matt also serves on various boards and commissions, including the board of directors for the Lee Highway Alliance and Habitat for Humanity Northern Virginia. And he currently co-chairs NAIOP, Northern Virginia's Arlington Committee. So um, I forgot to mention, I'm going to be, uh, the, I'm going to be uh, giving the speaker bios in the order that they will present. So the next person on uh, is Marsha Johnston. And her, I'm going to read her bio. Marsha is currently chair of voter support for the Arlington Democrats. She began volunteering, volunteering with Arl, Arl Dems in 2017, and she served as an 08 Obama delegate for California 53 San Diego and commun communications lead for Obama San Diego. Okay, next, uh, that next person that will be presenting is Matt Royer. Matt Royer is the campaign's director for the Virginia Young Democrats, the resolution's chair of the 8th Congressional District Democratic Committee and the vice chair, vice president rather, of the Arlington Young Democrats. He's also a professional campaign strategist and digital campaign consultant for progressive candidates up and down the ballot, having campaigned for Democrats on the state level here in his home state of Virginia. Matt also serves in leadership for Green New Deal of Virginia, the Virginia Justice Democrats, and as a labor activist here in Virginia. And last but not least is Jill Birdwhistle. 
Jill R. Birdwhistle, PhD, is a longtime Arlington Democrats volunteer, currently serving as DPVA Voter Protection Co-Liaison for Arlington after 11 years as a voter protection poll observer in various downstate precincts. Jill has degrees from the University of Kansas, University of Virginia, and University of Pennsylvania. She retired three years ago after nine years as the COO of the American Association of University Women, AAUW. Formerly, Jill served on the graduate faculties of the University of Kansas and University of Virginia and the Tulane University Division of Health Systems Management. Subsequently, she was Senior VP for America's Health Television Network and served as a senior executive for several national nonprofit organizations and the director of Too Large Alcoholism slash Drug Education and Rehabilitation Programs. Jill began her diverse career as a high school teacher and a labor negotiator for 12 Alaskan fishing unit, unions. Now that's pretty interesting. <laughs> Okay, and with that, um, I am going to hand it over to, uh, to Matt Weinstein for our first presentation. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I lied. We are going to do a poll. <laughs> I forgot about our polls. Okay, so before we get started, um, we thought we'd get a, an idea of where everybody was, you know, in, in terms of this voting process. Like, how many people have already voted? Um, you know, so our first question is, have you voted already in the fall 2020 election in Virginia? So um, I think, Alexandra, you need to provide the instructions maybe on how to, to do that. I guess invite, no, that's not it. I take myself off mute. Okay, I'm going to launch the poll. There will be two, two poll, two poll questions that we're going to have. Um, so please go ahead and just answer both of them. At the same time, we'll just keep it open for maybe 30 seconds. So while I launch the poll. Launched and ended. Wow. Okay. So how long are we going to give them for the poll? Like, what, 30 seconds? Yes. 45 seconds? 30 seconds. Okay, guys. Better do it quick. It didn't let me do it. Okay. I'll give Ken another few seconds. No, I mean, it won't let me. It says it's over. Oh. Well, okay. Fazia is saying it won't let me do it because my first answer was no, I think. Um, Fazia, do you want to just speak up and let us know what's going on? Well, I walked away for a minute and I came back and the uh, survey was there. So I just pressed, have you voted? And I said no. And then it won't let me do anything else. It won't let me submit it. Because the second question basically is if you voted, please. Well, yeah, then you can't, then it wouldn't make sense. So it won't let me do anything. Obviously, the second question is moot if the first question, the answer is no. Um, so it won't let me submit my first answer. OK, so go ahead and just drop your answer in the chat then, and we'll, we'll count it that way. OK. OK. I'm going to close the poll. Okay. Because we have fall vote questions. Um, so I'm going to share the results now so everyone can see. Uh, we have nine people on this call and um, well, it didn't allow, I mean, because I was running the poll, I wasn't able to answer it myself, but I would be in the no category. Um, I'm going to do that this week. I already voted. I even took a video of it. I just, I have to post it to Facebook. <laughs> so the, the majority, um, so everyone who's voted early has done so in person rather than doing the absentee by mail. So 
Um, that is just an interesting point for us to keep in mind as we present this information. So thanks for participating in the, the, these first two poll questions. So we've got another question for you, another poll question. You guys aren't done yet. We told no, you. We, we did those two. We did those two. Oh, those were the two questions? Yeah, those were the two. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, that's right. Duh. You had them. I thought you were going to do them separately. All okay. right. Well now, Matt, it is your turn. So, you know, I'm going to turn it over to you and thanks for, um, thank you for uh, agreeing to, you know, give us the benefit of, of your knowledge and experience on this very important topic. Sure. Well, thanks Fatima and thank you everyone, everyone for having me tonight. Again, my name is Matt Weinstein. I am the vice chair of the Arlington Electoral Board and as Fatima read my background, but I also um, have a lot of experience in voter protection. I ran it for the McAuliffe campaign in 13. I was the deputy for Obama in 12. And I've been, I was doing it for the, Obama, for the Arlington Democrats for years after that. So it's an issue near and dear to my heart. And I'm very excited to be here and, and give you some information. So my presentation today is give you just a foundation for how the election is going to be run from, from today until Friday after the election. Um, we're now 28 days out from the election, so I'm sure most of you on this call are more than familiar with how elections are run in Arlington and uh, in Virginia generally. This year, a lot has changed. It's no exaggeration to say that we're getting new guidance from the Department of Elections virtually every single day about drop boxes and how to cure absentee ballots and things every day. So it's changing quite rapidly, and the goal of my presentation is to make things as clear as possible for you going forward until the election. And then I'll hand it over to the real grassroots leaders on the call who will get you motivated and get you ready to vote and, and really stress the importance of how important this election is. So with that said, I'm ready to dive into it. Next slide. So we'll give you a very quick overview of the election process in Virginia. Um, so Virginia, like most states, it's um, you know a state run process administered locally. So it, the statewide level, we have the State Board of Elections, which is a five-member board um, with three Democrats and two Republicans. Sorry, back up. Three-member board with two Democrats and one Republican. The Democrats are obviously the same party as the governor, and the Republicans are the same party as the runner-up for the governor's election. And that's the way it is at the local electoral board level as well. So we have two Democrats and one Republican on the electoral board. And we have the Department of Elections, who, has, which, who involves the Commissioner of Elections, director of operations and professional staff. And they're really running, um, running the department day to day and really pushing out guidance and really helping with technical issues and doing all the heavy lifting day to day. So in the statewide um, structure for election administration is pretty similar to what happens here in Arlington. We, be, we have the electoral board. Again, I am one of the two Democrats on the board. Um, we hire the registrar. We hire election uh, officers. We, um, we finalize absentee ballots. We basically oversee the whole process, but we're really just kind of like the management um, for, the, for, the, for the election office because we have a, a registrar who really manages the day-to-day -day and the election staff. I'm sure many of you in, have interacted with Gretchen Reinemeyer, our registrar over the years. She's doing a really good job and uh, her team's doing a really good job under enormous pressure and stress this year. Um, we've had a record number of absentee ballot requests, and again, things are changing every day. So I, I really commend her and her staff for what they've done. And then we have officers of election. They're the people inside the polls, the chief, the assistant chief, who are helping voters successfully vote on election day. Next slide. So Virginia election law, for those of you who are really curious about how the process works and what the rules are, um, I'll let you know that Virginia election law is governed by statute, regulation, and guidance from the Department of Elections. You can read um, the state code provisions in 20, Title 24.2 of the Code of Virginia, and then the regulations particular to the State Board of Elections in um, the Administrative Code. Then the Department of Elections, as I mentioned before, is issuing guidance quite often, kind of clarifying gray areas and unknowns, previously unknowns um, from recently enacted legislation and regulations. They issue formal written guidance, like we got some guidance tonight, making it clear that um, localities should be reporting absentee numbers they receive by 11 o'clock on election night. Because as some of you may know, there's a new law this year saying that absentee ballots can be received by noon Friday after the election and still count. And there was a 
unclear question as to whether um, we had to report all the absentee numbers afternoon Friday after we received all the ballots or whether we could split it up and report what we received on election night and then again report what we received by Friday. So we received guidance today saying that we should report what we have by 11 o'clock on election night. And that's just one example of guidance we've been getting virtually every day. Uh, there's the General Registrar Electoral Board Greb Book, and that is really a detailed step-by-step -step guide on election law in Virginia. So it's highly relevant and very helpful. So I urge you, if you're curious, to read it. And then on election day, offices of election refer to what's called the what ifs guidance, which really walks through common problems and common situations and how to resolve them with voters. Next slide. Yeah. All right, so voting has begun. As most of you know, and as the polls bear out, uh, voting started September 18th. Um, we're getting pretty much over a thousand per day voting in person in Arlington, and it's just been a tremendous turnout. And, um, and it's just been remarkable to see how excited people have been to vote already. Um, so it's gone off to a hot start and we're going to keep going and I'll give you the specific deadlines and, um, and schedules for early voting as I go through this presentation. Next slide. All right, so we have absentee voting in Virginia now. Um, prior to this year, as many of you know, you had to have an excuse to vote absentee in Virginia. And with new, a new law the General Assembly passed this year, we have no excuse absentee voting, which some people interchangeably refer to as early voting. We have 45 days of it, which means, again, it started September 18th and will go until October 31st. Um, there are two types of absentee voting. There's absentee in person, which most of you, again, by looking at the polls, have already done. You just go down to 2200 Clarendon Boulevard. You vote like you do on election day. You, just, you check in, you show your ID, you vote, put in the machine, and that's that. You also have absentee by mail. Um, so we've received an enormous number of absentee by mail requests. I think before September 18th is around 49,000, give or take, um, which is just a huge number. And um, it is a very common way to people, for people to vote this year because of COVID. So I'll walk through all the diff different rules for both types of absentee voting, but that's, those are the two types. Um, so absentee in person, each city and county in Virginia designated at least one absentee in person location. Most have, have picked more than that. I mean, Arlington, uh, we chose four other satellite locations. So we will have five places to vote early starting October 17th. And as I mentioned before, voting in person, absentee in person is just like voting on election day, more or less. Next slide. All right. So, um, in Arlington, again, as I mentioned, it started on September 18th at 2200 Clarendon Boulevard. That is the old vacant Wells Fargo office right by the Starbucks and Courthouse Plaza. Um, so these are the general hours. I'm not going to belabor them. Um, I really recommend you go to the registrar's website for more details. But the main thing is to know that starting October 17th, we are going to have satellite voting at the Aurora Hills Community Center, Langston Brown Community Center, Madison Community Center, Walter Reed Community Center, and um, those satellite locations will be open for two weeks starting October 17th. I will say there will be no Sunday voting, so those are the dates, but you can't, we won't have any voting on Sunday. Next slide. Yeah, hey, I, just, I just wanted to, uh, real quick, um, I think you don't need to go into terrific detail on these, great detail, because I, I believe Matt Royer is also going to provide detail, so just, uh, yeah, you okay. can, if you want to, you can, <laughs> you can just give a high level of view. It's up to you. Okay. Uh, well, here's how you can request absentee by mail, uh, abs a ballot by absentee by mail. Um, as Fatima mentioned, now we'll go into this later. Um, and we started sending out ballots on September, September 18th. So I'm sure some of you have gotten your ballot already. Next slide. Uh, ballots must be received by 5 p.m. on October 23rd. Um, so ballot requests must be received by then, which is 11 days before the election. Uh, you can drop off ballots at the registrar's office or the designated drop boxes, and I'll give more details on that later. And they must be received by the registrar by noon Friday after the election, so by noon on November 6th. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned before, we had 49,394 ballot requests before absentee voting began which is just a huge number. Um, you can drop off your ballots at the registrar's office 
um, or you can drop it off at satellite locations or any polling place on election day. It doesn't have to be your own. You can just drop it off at any Arlington polling location on election day and they'll still receive it. And then we have a new process this year where if you didn't comply with the requirements on the envelope, um, particularly envelope B, the registrar's office will contact you within three days of receiving your ballot and instruct you on what you have to do to cure the mistake and still have your vote count. So that's new this year too. Next slide. So election day, uh, polls are open from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. If you're in line at seven, you can vote. Um, you must vote at your regular polling place. And I really urge you to go to the Virginia Citizen Portal to confirm where you're supposed to vote because Virginia is a state that is required under their constitution uh, to have voters vote at the polling place in which they're registered. If you, if I vote, I'm in Glen Carlin, if I voted at the, um, you know, it, it, any other precinct other than my own, I'd cast a provisional ballot and it would not count. So you have to vote in your own precinct. Um, you will be asked to provide an ID. Um, so you can either provide a photo ID or a non-photo ID, such as a utility bill, bank statement, or government, um, government check or sign an ID confirmation statement, basically asserting that you are who you say you are under penalty of perjury. Um, this, as some of you may know, we had a voter ID law in Virginia until this year, and all the, the, the new law does that passed this year is go back to the system we had prior to 2013, which is you, you're supposed to have an ID, but if you don't, you just sign an affidavit saying you are who you say you are and you can still vote. So this will really cut down a number of provisional votes cast this year. Next slide. So after election day, most of you probably think election day is over, the election's over, we're all done, right? No, no, no. Uh, on the electoral board, we, our work is not done. Actually, most of our heavy lifting for the election is gonna be the day after and then a couple days after. So what we do is we meet the day after election day for the provisional voter meeting and we decide whether provisional votes cast on election day will count. So common reasons people cast a provisional ballot is they vote in the wrong precinct. Um, they request an absentee ballot and they vote on election day. So that's gonna happen an awful lot this year. Um, and in that case, the elections office needs to confirm the absentee ballot was not received and counted. And the voter can cast a regular ballot if they, um, I'm sorry, I'm back up. This is the, um, so what I'm talking about here is the system we're, we're using now where if you request an absentee ballot by mail and when you go vote early, you can cast a regular ballot if you bring your, their ballot with them to the polling place on election day. So, um, so that's how you can cast a regular ballot. If you don't bring a ballot with you, you cast a provisional ballot. Um, or the voter's registration status is not clear. So you may have registered, you know, it, you may have registered in your home precinct, but then you moved a couple years ago and you thought you updated your, your uh, registration, but you actually didn't. We have to clarify that and then determine whether you're, where you're actually registered to vote. So next slide. Then finally, after election day, we have the canvas. So the electoral board and election staff meet to certify the election results. And this is usually two or three days after the election. And it's really important to know, not people, a lot, a lot of people know this, the election day results are unofficial. So um, what we issue on election night are the statement of results, the unofficial statement of results. And what we do with the canvas is check our math. So we check the voting, um, the, the tape from the machines against the statement of results that we came up with on election night and make sure the math lines up. And sometimes people meant to write a six when they wrote a nine or they put one extra zero by accident. And this is where we really catch those mistakes and then issue the, the, certif the election certification and we certify the results. So that's it, um, I think for my slides. One more, I think next, check one more slide. Yes, yeah, so if, you, if you have questions, uh, you can go to the uh, registrar's website at vote.arlingtonva.us, the Department of Elections website, call the Arlington Voter Registration and Elections Office. They have a specific number for absentee voting questions. Um, you can also email them at voters at arlingtonva.us. They have a specific email address for absentee questions as well. So absentee arlingtonva.us. So I think that's it. Um, I'm happy to... Um, kick it over to Marsha and then answer any questions people might have um, towards the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, so I had, this is my first slide. Before I jump in there, I was just gonna say, I know Fatima had asked to say something about the importance of voter registration. 
And uh, one thing I would just, I, I was thinking of an anecdote or just a, an experience from my time in San Diego, uh, working on grassroots for Obama for two years, um, basically, and was very much involved in um, voter registration efforts in San Diego, which is, if any of you know San Diego, it, it is, um, it's a Navy town, um, has historically been pretty Republican, um, despite pockets of sort of some Democratic stuff. Anyway, over the course of four years, right up to the election in 08, um, we split San Diego's registration from Republican majority to Democratic majority. And I saw things like um, registering a whole bunch of college students in my own district, which I represented for Obama, uh, like the last day of registration. I think we got like, I don't know, it was a couple of, a few hundred, I think, um, registrations that day. And it literally made the difference in probably my going because it gave us another, another person because it's all proportional, right? How many people they send as delegates based on how, you know, um, what the tally was. Anyway, so very exciting registration. Um, and so, and obviously to vote, you have to be registered in this country. It's not automatic. You have to do it. Um, the deadline is a week from today, October 13th. So we're going to be busy this weekend. We have a few, uh, we've got some, some events going over the weekend um, to try to get those stragglers. Um, I would encourage everyone to check your registration status. Um, particularly in Arlington, we don't really have issues of purging voters, but you know, things happen. We've had people check their status and find they're not in there and they've been voting for 30 years and sometimes it's like the birth date is wrong or they're missing a letter out of their name or something. So it's very good to please check, uh, make sure that you're in there and that your profile says active. And then, um, and if you are in there, you don't need to do anymore, uh, except go vote, of course. Um, and you can register, um, uh, online if you have a DMV issued license or ID. Um, the reason for that, that you have to have that where you don't have to have if you're using the paper form is because online they're using the motor vehicles uh, signature that you've given as the sort of uh, control mechanism for verifying who you are. So um, that's why you have to have that in order to do the whole thing online to complete it um, on the paper form it's just your social security number. You don't actually need to put down a DMV license, but you also have to put the full social security number, which some people have trouble wanting to do. So next slide, please. I don't know. Nope. Oh. Oh. oh, did you, this is anyway, that's good. I don't, um, it's good to see this is the, the URL to that link. When you go to oh. the Department of Elections, this is where you can register. You can go back there if you want. <laughs> Sorry, to the URL, whatever. Okay. That's the, the interface where you can, pardon me, uh, register or um, check your polling place. It's a nice, it's pretty user friendly, the, the State Department of Elections. And I would, I did want to make one little note here uh, to encourage you. Um, I know Matt put those links at the end of his and that's great. It would, if you're going to check information, don't go anywhere except the Virginia Department of Elections site or the county site, <coughs> excuse me, because we have, um, with this election being so uh, just top of mind for everyone and so, so much involvement, there's quite a, we've had like two or three national organizations, nonprofits, and they mean well, um, putting up information about Virginia that was wrong. So I had gone in and talked to them about getting it and you know, have them change it. So anyway, best shot, go to the Department of Elections and you don't have any problem with getting information that's not right. So voter registration, if you don't have a driver's license or ID, like I said, paper application, all you need is your social security number and you can get them at local libraries, at the DMV office, although those are some, I guess not as open these days. You can also get them at the registrar's office. And I will tell you, when, uh, you can also return them to the early polling location right now. They are doing that um, uh, because they're staffed enough. They are just taking them. Also, where, where Matt indicated at 2100 on the third floor, they're taking them as well. But there's sort of two locations there at Courthouse where you can both get a form and fill it out and then return it back to them. 
And so there you go. And then to vote. That's it. Thank you, Marsha. And I think the next person up is Matt Royer. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here to talk about this stuff. Um, so right now, um, you know, obviously you have two options to vote before election day, which is early in person and then um, absentee by mail, which is what uh, Matt went over on his slides. Um, but I'll just like, you know, basically talk about a little bit more of the logistics. As of right now, um, while we're seeing all these issues with the USPS and everything like that with the, with the mail, um, voting early in person is probably your safest and most efficient way to vote for this election just because you know that one, your ballot is going directly to the registrar, two, it's gonna be counted and won't be lost anywhere along the way. Whereas um, in most places, uh, we've been seeing that it, absentee ballots have been delayed a little bit in, in some cases and um, you know other places uh, they might be getting delayed going back to uh, being delivered, however, now that there are the there is the ability for folks to use drop boxes, that's also a great way to do that. Um, if you have requested your absentee ballot, um, you can fill it out and take it to one of those places um, wherever your locality allows that to, to happen. Um, but basically, you know what it comes down to with early voting and absentee by mail, it make it's not only more effective for you, but it also makes it safer for the poll workers on election day because they had one less person that they have to be uh, coming to contact with, one less person that they have to worry about, you know, if they had, um, you know, the coronavirus, if they were exposing them to anything um, or anything like that. Also, you know, it, uh, it, it, uh, in terms of one less person, uh, it also cuts down on wait times, which I'll go into a little bit later as well. Um, but also, you know, with early voting, uh, and if you're waiting until election day for whatever reason, stuff happens, right? Uh, you know, emergencies come up, you know, you, your car breaks down on your way to the polling place, you know, any number of things can happen. Uh, you know, I, I point to, to a personal story myself, you know, this um, past year, um, uh, during Super Tuesday, uh, I was ready to go, ready to vote. Um, and then a week early, uh, right before that, um, because I was waiting until the actual election day to vote, a week before that, I uh, ended up uh, actually uh, coming down with a pretty serious uh, case of pneumonia. I was in the hospital for seven days and I missed the election and I wasn't able to get an absentee ballot in time. So yes, like I said, personally, I know what it's like to miss uh, the election itself and not be able to, to vote. So I highly encourage you, if you know who you're voting for already, if you know all the information, if there's nothing that could possibly happen between now and November 3rd to change your mind, you should definitely vote early. Um, you know, and also voting early shows the momentum that we're having here um, with how many people have actually gone out. And, you know, like I said, right before this, early voting um, is less wait times and, and with less wait times, it means that actually more people can go out and vote. More people are likely to go out and vote if they're seeing uh, less uh, shorter lines um, and they can actually make time for themselves on either before or on election day for them to actually go to the polls and vote. And what statistically speaking, when we see more people voting, Dems are more likely to win. And that's just how it is. Um, that's why uh, Republicans have tried for so long to suppress people's votes. It's why um, conservatives have tried to make it a lot harder for certain demographics of people, especially um, black and brown people to vote in certain places because they know that they were more likely to vote um, a Democrat and they know that that makes it harder for them to win those elections. Um, and right now, just to give you an idea of like where we're at, uh, at the beginning of this week, we were at about 660,000 people in Virginia have, have voted early in person. And then 1.4 million people have actually requested their absentee ballot. And if you add all that up, that's about 61% of the electorate right now of, of eligible voters that have either uh, voted or are planning to vote early. And if you compare that to 2016, only 72% 
of all eligible voters voted in 2016 here in Virginia. So that means, you know, we're about 10% behind that. So if you're going off of, um, you know, comparisons here, you know, between uh, the 2014 midterms and the 2018 midterms, we, we went from about, um, let's see, it was about, uh, tw uh, went up about 20% um, uh, turnout. And then between 2015 and 2019, in off off year elections, we went about up about 30%. So if you're going off that, we're probably going to see about 85% of the electorate here in Virginia actually going out to vote in this election because that's just one. There's been about two things that have happened. One, we've made it um, thanks to the Virginia General Assembly, we have made it so much easier for people to access the ballot box either before or on election day. Two. We're basically planning ahead this year. Um, we're not taking for granted, um, you know, the ability to vote in person because of everything that we've been shown over this year. And also here in Arlington, we had a little bit of a test run um, earlier with between the school board elections and and the um, and the special election for county boards. So everybody knows pretty much what to do right now when it comes to voting early. However, even when we did have that early voting in uh, July for the county board uh, special election, a lot of people showed up still on election day to vote. Um, there, I would say the majority of people still showed up that day. So, you know, it is very possible that we, that 61% will, will jump from uh, early voting uh, to election day voting. And so, you know, while all this is happening, you know, it gives more time for the registrar to process votes without being rushed on election day because a lot of times what happens when you have most people voting on election day, it takes them a really long time to count those votes and tally up who will be the winner. Now, from what I have heard when I've been on these calls with the DPBA about uh, voter protection and, and the, voting, um, uh, the voting teams here in Virginia, we have seen that they have been having a pretty easy time pre-processing a lot of these ballots that they've already uh, received. So that, that points to having, um, you know, a lot of our results earlier than we expected it to. You know, I think that um, I was obviously really young at the time, but a lot of people know exactly how 2000 felt uh, when it took a very long time to know the, the uh, results from Florida, uh, whether or not uh, it was Gore or Bush. And then, you know, we saw what happened in the fallout on that. So it's like, you know, basically making it easier for one, for us to be able to process all of these, uh, these votes so that we know who is the winner and we're not having to wait over like a week or so to, to know who the real winner is of the election. And also if you vote early, another Oops. thing- Sorry. Yeah, I'll yeah, go back real quick. All good. Another thing that you can do is you can be available to volunteer on election day, whether that is greeting people at the polls on behalf of the Democratic Party or even working as a poll worker. Because right now what, what is going on is that we are, uh, we're experiencing, you know, a lot of these old, uh, poll workers are, are elderly folks who do this every single year, but are not as, um, you know, don't feel as safe to go out and work at the, at the polls this year during election day they don't want to be exposed to the virus. So that means that it's really reliant upon younger folks to go out and be a part of that. And especially right now, what we have heard here in Virginia is the Hampton Roads area has been where they need actual people to staff the polls, not handing sample, not handing sample ballots, not watching the polls for, for the Democratic Party for voter protection, but actually physically handing the ballots to people, checking people in, checking people's registration, that kind of work. So also as an added bonus, when you vote early, all those voter calls and all those canvases stop. So you don't have to get any more of those. You can tell people when they call you, oh, I already voted. They check that off. They don't, they, they'll never bother you ever again, which I think is an added bonus so that you can just go on about your day doing whatever you want to do. You're like, hey, I already voted. You don't have to call me again. And then they just, they, you're just off the list at that point. So. If you want your phone to stop ringing, if you want, you know, to stop getting so much mail, if you want to stop seeing those things pile up on your doorstep, I would highly encourage you to vote early. But, you know, for all these reasons right now, I mean, that's why we passed these laws, right? That's why we passed all of this legislation in the Virginia General Assembly to make it easier to vote so that people had this option. 
I know that one thing people will point to and say, well, didn't they make election day uh, a, a holiday for that reason, for a state holiday? However, what happens with that when you make a state holiday is everybody who works in the uh, service industry, um, in the restaurants, in, in uh, retail, in all those places still end up working that day because everybody has the day off who works in the state. So they just go out and do whatever, right? You, you run your errands and everything. So those folks who are then having to work on that day don't get that day off to vote. So it's very, it makes it much easier for those people who go and, um, and show up to, uh, you know, who can go and vote early so that they don't have to worry about having election day off to go vote. Um, so I highly encourage you, if you have not already, which it sounded like a few folks had, even if you've requested your ballot um, in the mail, you can bring that with you and hand it to the person and just say, I want to vote in person instead. And then they can take it from there. You can also take your ballot, um, if you've already filled it out, walk it down to the registrar's office and hand it to them that way. Or at the, um, at the early polling location, you can also hand it to them there. They'll accept it and then you're done. So you don't have to worry about that. But um, like I said, it's from now until October 31st, you can do that. Um, uh, on Fridays, uh, I mean, uh, Monday through Fridays uh, at from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then towards the end of the month, it will be open until 7 p.m. And then on those Saturdays, as Matt had said, um, it will also be open in those select places. Um, and then also, I believe that one other location will open up about two weeks uh, out from the election. So you can have that option to go wherever, but make a plan and then vote early. And then, um, you know, we will we'll probably end up pulling this thing off a lot quicker than we thought we would. So thank you. And I will just add real fast before Jill jumps in. Um, stay tuned. We're going to have 24 seven drop boxes, I believe nine across the county starting um, October 17th. So those will be places where you can go drop off your mail-in absentee ballot at any point, 24-7, um, uh, from that from October 17th until Election Day. So stay tuned. And um, just Thanks to, for that update, Matt. Yeah. yeah. Just to answer Ken's uh, like his question in the chat real quick, he said, "Is there a difference between absentee ballots and mail-in ballots?" Absentee mail-in ballots are the same thing. Uh, however. Early voting in person is a new thing because you don't have to have an excuse to vote early. Absentee only refers to the places where you had to have an excuse to vote um, not on election day. Like if you work outside of the state or you know you'll be traveling or something along those lines, that would be considered absentee. Whereas voting in person early or voting by mail early, it just means you're voting early and you don't have to have an excuse. So that's kind of where that difference is. Now, uh, you know, if you did have an excuse that would technically be voting by absentee, but it's a moot point at this point because of those laws that have changed this year. Yeah, I'm wondering if the window for absentee voting might be, um, you know, longer than the one for early voting because early voting started on September 18th. Um, and uh, well, I guess I, my question can wait till the, till the end, but it seems to me that, um, absentee voting um, sort of gives you a little bit more flexibility because if you're, especially if you're going to be gone longer than the time, then let's say you're out of the country, um, you know, you can't go to your polling station, obviously, um, and, you, and you're like a lot of people that work for international organizations, they won't be back. So that might, I'm wondering if that's an option for people that fall into that category. I I mean, I think that it's this, it's the same thing at this point in time, because, um, you know, like I said, it doesn't matter if you are out of the country or not, or mm. in a way, um, you're still voting in person. I mean, you're still voting early by mail. By mail. Okay. The only, yeah, the only difference in timing for the two methods of, of absentee or early voting, absentee by mail and early voting is that early voting, so voting in person at either 2200 Clarendon Boulevard or one of the four satellite locations ends October 31st, which is the Saturday before the election. But you can actually drop off your mail-in absentee ballot to the registrar's office the Sunday before the election or the Monday before the election. So those two days, you can still drop off your ballot, but you can't vote in person early those two days. Right. But, yeah. you wouldn't, but you wouldn't have been able to vote in person Fatima, before, or even by mail, uh, because the ballots were not mailed out until September 18th. 
So you okay. Have to, you know, right. Yes. That clarifies that. Thank you, Marsha. Okay, I think we should go on to our next speaker, uh, Jer uh, Jill Birdwhistle, um, and then you know there'll, there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, thanks, guys, for for fielding those questions at this point um, in the uh, in the presentation. So, Jill, um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> my friends have done such a great job of giving you the technical aspects of of. Uh, uh, voting in uh, Arlington, voting in Virginia, um, I think I'm going to loosen up a little bit and talk a little bit more about what it feels like these days on both sides of the of uh, the voting process. And I think the, the first thing I want to mention is, um, as uh, uh, the Democratic Party liaison to uh, Arlington, uh, we have been sending a lot of, of uh, emails to 185 volunteers we now have here and the Democratic Party in Virginia has more. So if you wanna get on my mailing list, we just sent out something yesterday and my email, I should have written it on here, is jillbird1 at comcast.net, jillbird1 at comcast.net. And uh, I welcome your contacts and I'll send you back our latest email information uh, about being part of the team. And that starts me out to say uh, the Democratic Party of Virginia, the DPVA, actually uh, is the supervising uh, entity for voter protection. And we actually, those of us who are involved with that are part of a team through the uh, Democratic Party of Virginia. They provide the, uh, they manage the system of, of voter protection. They train us virtually. Uh, we're credentialed by the DPVA, though uh, we operate under statute and uh, uh, the regulations that are created by the State Board of, of Elections and managed locally by the County Board of Elections and the Registrar. The role, I've done a lot of poll greeting over many years, and most of you know what that is. When you're doing poll greeting, uh, you're providing materials and information to people who come to the polls uh, early and on the day of voting. Uh, it's a different role than voter protection. Voter protection roles, voter protection includes a number of things, including a hotline and um, uh, service, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, watching over the canvas. But the, the central aspect of voter protection uh, is poll observing. Uh, I've been uh, doing this now, I've, I've done 11 years in the past of poll observing uh, downstate, mostly in uh, uh, Virginia Beach area and in Richmond. And it, that is a different experience than the one I've had so far. I've been uh, in the uh, poll uh, since it opened uh, doing voter protection. The, it, is, it is an almost a misnomer, certainly the voter intimidation, and I'll get to that, is part of it. But the primary role uh, uh, is to uh, be sure that people are able to vote. Our goal is that everybody, that the, the vote is handled as a free and fair election so that every eligible voter can vote a regular ballot quickly and easily without intimidation and trust their vote counts. And eligibility is a key word there because um, I've found a very contrasting experience uh, as Matt, one of the Matts, both of the Matts, I think, stressed, we need, uh, we need downstate uh, poll observers very much. It's a huge role downstate. My last uh, poll was uh, in uh, a racially gerrymandered, most of them are racially gerrymandered, uh, but uh, was under uh, court order. And so it was completely confusing because it was on the corner of a, co a co college campus. There were a lot of high rise um, elderly uh, people with uh, disabilities uh, who voted in that poll. And the uh, close to the time of the voting, all the, uh, the area that was, uh, that was covered in that precinct had been moved from another precinct. So, people were arriving and leaving and going to all sorts of places. And, and that comes to one of the 
the biggest issues. Can I go to the next slide, please? The, okay. uh, we do have inside poll observers and outside poll observers, uh, but uh, the, the role is complementary. It's also complementary with the, the poll greeters because poll observers, while we are now allowed to talk to the, the uh, voters, we can't see the ballot and we are uh, constrained in our conversation. The idea of a poll greeter, uh, I mean a poll observer, is to try to win over uh, the poll chief and the poll officials so that we can intervene more uh, frequently on behalf of, of voters' needs and they will turn to us to trust us. But we are in, that's the inside role. The outside role is to um, see problems as they might be arising, people who are worried. We don't do anything political. We don't talk about politics. The only thing we do do is if there's a provisional voter coming out of the poll uh, who perhaps wasn't, shouldn't have been a provisional voter or doesn't, or needs coaching as to how to cure that provisional vote, uh, ballot after, uh, after the election ends and before it uh, the the process after the post election process ends at noon on Friday, but uh, we have to follow some very strict rules that are set by uh, statute, as I said, uh, and we get them. Uh, we have uh, poll observer training frequently. It's done by DPVA. It's really very very good. Um, I recommend if anybody's interested, as I said, I gave you my email, jillberg1 at comcast.net, and I'll make sure you get hooked up with, with the uh, uh, trainings. Uh, they're done virtually, uh, and the trainings are excellent. Um, and we get a detailed manual. This is a, this is a core element that really is something that we need to study hard and be sure we understand what to do. So if something, if we see something not going right, uh, we can speak up to the uh, poll officials, particularly to the poll chief, and point out a difficulty. Or if we get good relationships with the poll officials, we can whisper in their ear, not so close anymore, uh, or say sort of loudly to them uh, so that the uh, uh, voters can hear the things that are, are actually what what the rules are. This isn't happening this this year at the polls. I've been enormously impressed. The uh, I've been working at what's called the CAP, which is the uh, Central Absentee Poll, and it is um, 2200 Clarendon Boulevard. Obviously, I haven't worked at any other satellites yet because they aren't open, but. Um, always the two most important uh, problems or the most likely problems are voter ID issues and residence issues. Uh, where do you live now? What do we have on hand? Um, but voter ID issues are so much better now because we don't have to have the photo ID. So with the and extending to uh, items like um, uh, bills from, from uh, public services and the bank uh, statement, this, this really makes a difference because people arrive, they've forgotten everything they should have had, but there's nothing like a woman's purse. Down there somewhere, uh, I've seen people pull out all kinds of, um, of items that turn out to be legitimate and our, our poll officials are absolutely wonderful. They'll try to spell your name a different way. They'll ask you about your, your um, uh, middle name uh, all sorts of tips and tricks that I've never seen as done as well uh, as they do here. So mostly we aren't seeing residence issues. Uh, the uh, inclusion of the, the gold affidavits allow people to come in. They say, if, if, when they say, um, uh, I asked for an absentee ballot, I didn't get it, or I forgot to bring it. And if you sign that, ap that affidavit that uh, uh, Matt Weinstein mentioned, you can vote. And uh, I've only seen a couple of people who can't vote, uh, I mean, who aren't voting now. And even uh, I've seen the, um, 
the poll officials giving people uh, registration forms saying, fill it out, call us the first of the week and, and you're probably in, in the system. And it, it seems to work. Typically, the problems that we're looking out for is mis misunderstanding, often it's a language issue. Uh, but fortunately, in this poll, we have people who speak several different languages. We have Korean, uh, Vietnamese, uh, Arabic, um, and a few who aren't quite so facile with a few other languages. Uh, so uh, that, that problem is obviated. Some people are just confused. It is confusing, especially when we weren't allowed to bring in the, the uh, ballot before and drop it off. Uh, I mean, or, or drop it off. Uh, you, if, you, if you applied for a ballot, you had to vote the ballot. You weren't, you weren't allowed to, to uh, get this, this um, affidavit. Uh, some people just come in impatient. They were trying to rush and trying to get out. Well, it's pretty well cured. Uh, I watched the longest line that we've we've ever had uh, at the uh, cap so far, <clears throat> and it kind of wrapped around the uh, courthouse or the county building, but we went and marked it. It was from beginning to end about I would say 75 to 100 people voted in 20 minutes. Uh, it's a fast process because the staff is so good. People come in often nervous, anxious about the situation. If they happen to be anxious people, they get anxious about that. But um, uh, the, the nice, the poll uh, officials are so nice, they seem to relax them. Even the elderly people, they have private rooms for them. Disability, they have private rooms. Vision uh, issues are resolved with big uh, font uh, screens and really nice people. Um, we don't have long wait times. The, the process inside the poll takes between three and five minutes, five if you have a problem. Um, there are plenty of COVID related concerns, but um, there's a pen, a new pen for every person. They're all sanitized. The staff is constantly washing up, uh, using uh, disinfectant in the voting booths. Um, social distance is, is well managed and I've, I hardly ever see it. Well, I never have seen anybody without a, a uh, mask, just some that maybe aren't wearing it right, but everybody sort of gives them a, a big berth and they notice after a while that that uh, everything is very sanitary and, and concern for them. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so uh, it's also a very trusting process inside the poll. It's because the, the poll off officials are making it so. We're watching constantly to see if there are problems. And usually those problems more come in the, in the mindset of the, the voter. So very often, uh, this has been true in every poll I've been in, uh, voting officials will ask the poll observer to help out, to comfort people, to walk with them. In other polls, we, we have access to the poll chief directly. This is a bank we're using it for the, the um, cap for the central uh, poll. Uh, so the um, poll officials are, hang out, are behind the what would be where the, the um, uh, bank people are uh, welcoming, you know, where, whether we transact our business. But um, they're so quick to come around outside and, and talk to the voter uh, personally and, and at social distance. Um, this really calms people and makes them feel a lot better. Uh, I know there's been a lot of training uh, for this, the satellite uh, uh, poll officials and uh, we will have uh, poll observers in all of them, but I'm hoping for the kind of, of uh, scene I've seen this year. It, it's been remarkable that a huge number of people have come in with their ballots to drop them in the drop box and they see how fast it is while they're waiting in, in line and they just go ahead and, and vote, a vote a regular ballot uh, and feel good, even better about it. Next slide, please. Um, the one that worries all of us the most um, 
is the least likely concern, at least likely to occur, but the most concerning, and that's voter intimidation. And uh, uh, again, what constitutes voter intimidation is uh, regulated by the Board of Elections or uh, and reportable by by observers. There's a, uh, uh, as one of the mats mentioned, there's a there's a 40 foot line. Political activity is absolutely prohibited inside that line, and protected by the poll chief, but. I have certainly been in, in the circumstance where uh, I've reported that to the chief, um, but we're not seeing much so far. In the local um, uh, satellites, uh, there, is, uh, there are circuit riders who go around and, and check to see if there are any problems or go, over, go to the, the uh, poll in case there are. Um, uh, the poll uh, uh, voter protection poll observers have a, um, a link to uh, the DPVA boiler room. So we're constantly in contact with lawyers who specialize in election law. And if there's anything going on, we report it immediately. Um, and of course, if something's scary, we can call 911 like anybody can. There's also a 300 foot uh, uh, line rule uh, where uh, outside of which voter intimidation, loud noise, reckless driving, all kinds of impediments to polls, even weapons, even looming uh, poll police presence. I've seen all of these things in other polls uh, downstate. Uh, I haven't seen anything like that uh, at, at our own poll. And I hope, I hope I don't, it's, it's, it can be scary. It can be noisy. Um, uh, my Coley is on, uh, Diana Gordon was out in Fairfax when they had that incident the other day, uh, the, on the first day, where people were driving through the line of, stand, of, of voters who were standing there to vote. And that was really scary. They weren't really uh, prepared, but our, our poll uh, officials are prepared. And uh, the cap is good because it's kind of off the street, but we really haven't seen anything uh, go on that should frighten anybody. Uh, and, and I can see that among our uh, voters because they come out talking about how excited they are and how pleased they are about how easy this process is. Um, I hope uh, every poll observer has the kind of good experience that I have, uh, feeling welcome in the poll and also um, feeling that the voter is having a wonderful experience that, that they can be proud of. So um, I have a lot of good stuff to say and urging you, please, if you can do voter uh, observation, it is, uh, we, we need more. We have a bunch, but we have 298 hours. Maybe we're down to 290, but we still have a lot of hours to go. No, that is right. And uh, then we have 80, no, 108 hours to fill at, on election day. And that's just here. And we do, hey, people, uh, we do need to go downstate very badly uh, with, with our poll observers. So thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Okay, well, thank you, Jill. That was, that was a very comprehensive um, overview of voter protection. And um, now I think we are ready for our next poll. So number, poll question number three is, what method will you use to vote? This is for the people, obviously, who haven't already voted. Um, okay. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I'm trying to open the... Um, I don't know why it's not showing the other poll questions. Oh, let's um, Well, I, I don't want to take too long on this. So uh, why don't you just, um, why doesn't everyone just put their answer in the chat for now? Because it's for some reason not letting me do multiple poll questions. Yeah, and I think, um, 
If I remember correctly from the answers to questions number one and two, most people had already voted, except for maybe um, one or two. Uh, am I Am I wrong about that? Uh, does anybody? Well, since we took that first poll, we had a few additional people who joined the meeting. Um, okay. Well, we, well, we had the speakers talking, so I just wanted let's give the um, the new participants an opportunity to share, you know, whether or not they voted or not, and okay. um, given the information, what method they will, are choosing to use. Perfect. Okay. So let's. Let's see, um, is everyone uh, entering their information in the chat box? If they're not able to, which I mean, obviously they're not able to do it in the poll directly. Okay, so Jill Birdwhistle says, I voted a regular ballot, so she's already voted. Um, Catherine White is saying she'll vote this week. Um, taking in my ballot and handing over will then vote in person. Cool. All right. And Marsha Johnston, uh, I believe is responding to Catherine. So, um, and Marsha said that she voted a regular ballot at 2200. Okay. In person, just in person. Yeah. Just, yeah. I, I had revoked my mail-in request, so we just went and voted in person. Okay. All right. Um, Marsha, I thought you had also said at one of our recent meetings something about, uh, was there some sort of scanner that you, if you wanted to go in and take your, your um, instead of putting it in the box, you could scan it right away? Was there? You, you can if you ask them to do that. Um, and, and there are people who have done that. Um, so... It is an option, uh, but you need to ask them when you get in there um, to say, you know, if, if you have your mail-in ballot and you would like to put it through the scanner, you can ask them to do that. Actually, um, the way I've seen it is people just, they'll often just give it back to you if you haven't messed it up. If you haven't done something to it, they just hand you back. When you hand them the envelope uh, of the uh, absentee ballot, They'll hand you back your envelope and give you back your ballot, and then you just go stick the ballot, you fill it out. If it has been fully filled out, they'll let you do it. Okay. Yeah, if you're not putting it in the box, if you're not dropping it off. Correct. You're not if if you're not dropping it off. So I I see another question from uh, Rehan Ilhan, who's saying uh, I have not voted. I just got our ballots in the mail. I'm wondering if there are boxes around Fairfax County and how I can find out where they are. Go to the Fairfax Department of Elections. Um, I don't know myself, I don't know if Matt knows. I don't know whether they, if Matt uh, Weinstein knows whether they have any, but. Um, yes, yeah. so I would urge you to look at the, the Fairfax Elections website, but I know they're gonna have 14 satellite locations, right? So you can drop off your ballots there and I'm sure they're gonna have 24 seven drop boxes in some of those locations, if not all. So I would check out their website, but. It, they, they should definitely have locations across Fairfax County uh, where you can drop off your ballot. And I think the government center, you know, if all else fails, is the government center just open? I, I don't know, I don't live, you know, obviously, but Fairfax, is that open to everybody that lives in Fairfax, regardless of where, or is that just, if you, yep. live, if, if you happen to live in the precinct that contains the government center? No, it's open to everyone. Okay, so that's another option. Um, Okay. Does anybody have any other questions? Have I, have I answered, have we answered all of the questions in the chat box, I guess? And if not, you know, or, and or do you, does anybody have any other questions? That's a, a question about volunteering. If somebody, if, well, you said they need more uh, people to be observers in Hampton Roads. <laughs> Can people from anywhere in the state be uh, poll workers elsewhere? Oh, yes, uh, shh, shh, I'm on. Uh, yes, they can. And if you just send me an email, I'll hook you up. You can always go to ArlingtonDemocrats.org. Uh, uh, you can also go straight to DPVA. But if you just send me an email, I'll send you all the link uh, to, to sign up. And you will get the opportunity to um, uh, indicate your preferences if you'd like to travel downstate. 
They need people early um, right now for the early voting. They need them for voting day and they especially need them in Hampton Roads. So um, I can I can give you the, uh, the, the link for that. Um, another question. Uh, one of our presidential candidates has suggested people just show up at the polls to uh, monitor what's going on. Can anybody show up to do that? What, 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 no, if that were to happen, what would happen? No, you need credentials to go. You have to show. We get credentials. You can get one person in the poll, one person outside the <clears> poll, <throat> and you get the credentials. They come from our, our uh, party chair, Democratic Party chair. Uh, and through her. And you're assigned, DPVA is assigning electronically the times you, you show up for each poll. So uh, unless you have credentials to, to do this, you can't go in and you don't get the credentials unless you've gone through training. So you have to go the, go the route, that route. Yeah, yeah, for the other party, it's the same thing. They need uh, credentials to be authorized representatives inside the polls. So the Republican Party of Virginia would have to organize something similar to what DPVA is doing um, to have poll observers there. Um, I don't know if they're doing it. Typically, they're not nearly as thorough or active as the Democrats are, um, but no one can be a poll observer inside of the polls unless they have a signed authorization form from the local party chair. Okay. Yeah, I wanna add a little bit to that because where you get assigned primarily outside of of Arlington are uh, where there's a potential for high democratic uh, votes. I have only once in the last, just making 12 years, ever been assigned where there was a, a Republican uh, poll observer and she only stayed a couple of hours and we were caged at the time anyway, so it didn't really matter. Most of the time we're in polls where they know they're going, they can get out if they have a really good experience. They can get a lot of Democratic uh, votes out. Okay. Uh, one other question: We're going to be uh, posting this, so somebody who's watching this, any advice for them if they show up to vote and they're protesters? I hope there won't be, but there were out in Fairfax, uh, like we talked about. My uh... just get in line and vote. My protesters, like Kent, are you talking about voter intimidation? You know, showing up to intimidate other voters? Well, showing up to make noise or whatever else they may be doing. Yeah, I mean, my advice would just be, um, you know, hold the line. Uh, we, uh, you know, that was basically the advice that they were giving out to, you know, Fairfax County voters when that was happening out there. Um, you know, they just stay in line. Um, you know, they can't engage with you. They can't, you know, really talk to you. They're not allowed to, um, I mean, they can talk to you, but, you know, they're not really allowed to physically engage with you. Um, so, you know, uh, it, as long as you're in that line, you're fine. You know, you're not doing anything wrong. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong that you're doing other than, you know, possibly voting against their candidate, which everybody has a right to do, um, no matter what, even though some people feel like that that might not be the case. Um, but, you know, and, and there will, there, there are people around who are also from the Democratic Party who are there, who are there as, you know, to be uh, sort of those watchers and to, to help with that voter protection that way. So that's why they're there. They're there to make sure that, you know, you're not being intimidated in any way. You're not, your vote is not being suppressed in any way. Um, so I would just highly encourage anybody, you know, whoever is watching this, if they are engaging with that, um, with any of those uh, protesters or have seen that, uh, just stay in line, make sure you get your vote in, and then um, you know everything will be fine after that. Okay. And also, I think we could add to that. Uh, every shift, we encourage everybody uh, who is doing poll observing to uh, walk around outside if there's not an outside poll observer, introduce themselves to um, uh, the Democratic volunteers, which there are a lot of, and if there's something going on, the uh, poll observer, outside poll observer, uh, comes right in and talk, uh, tells the poll chief. Uh, but we encourage our the Democratic volunteers to let us know they know who we are, and uh, uh, that everywhere everywhere we serve, we do the same thing. We we try to stop. Most of it isn't stopping it after it happens. It's stopping it 
as it's going to happen and then uh, having people who are responsible, the poll chief, or usually the poll chief has instructions on how to get in touch with the police if that's necessary. First, she or he comes outside usually and tells them to behave themselves. That often works. Um, it usually, it, the idea is not to let it build up. So the poll chief, just to be clear, Jill, the poll chief is not a law enforcement person. The poll chief is someone that is appointed to make sure the election runs smoothly and to try to mitigate any sort of uh, conflict. Well, the poll chief is actually in charge of the poll. And uh, in, in at our CAP, we, we have two that work there. They're, they're the ones who have the authorization to call the registrar with any issues or questions of, that they need to verify. Uh, they also have responsibility for everything inside the 40 foot line. Um, so they can come in and out and say how the poll is going to run. Um, they are an official, they work. And usually every, everyone I've ever met has been doing it for years. Right. So these are, these are really experienced people who know mm -hmm. the rules and who have already planned ahead. This this isn't their first rodeo, and it's also not the first. Right. They practice before they start. I, I want to give some other people uh, a chance to ask questions, but just really quickly, I guess my my question really went to the issue of you know this election in which you know for <laughs> various reasons that I don't have to elaborate. Uh, you know, most people already are aware that um, there apparently, you know, given the higher probability of, you know, potential interference, violence, even, you know, um, have there, have provisions been made for law enforcement to uh, intervene pretty quickly, I guess, is, is really, that's the heart of my question. And I, I want to take these, I want to make sure that there, there are two people that have been waiting. So I um, just, uh, yeah. We can answer that question now or, um, or allow them to, I just sort of wanted to ask that now since we were talking about it, but we can take, the, take it later since they've been waiting for a long time. <laughs> I felt guilty about asking it now because, um, you know, other people had been waiting for a long time, but I wanted to ask it now since we were talking about the topic, so. I'll just say, um, you know, the local police department is well aware of the potential for sort of disruption on election day. Um, so I, I know they'll be looking out for it. And the attorney general issued an opinion last week, I believe, that was sent to the registrars, making it abundantly clear the voter intimidation is a felony in Virginia. Um, so, you know, everyone's on the same page about what the repercussions could be if there is voter intimidation. So I think you know, if it happens, and I don't think it's happened in Virginia in my experience in the last eight years of doing voter protection, um, I think people are prepared to handle it and, and ready to, to take care of it. Okay, great. Thank you, Matt. Um, I think we should go to the next question now. Um, I don't know who had their hand up first. Um, I, I see a question from Catherine White that, um, Michael, do you, is it okay if I take Catherine's question first? Are you good with that? Okay. Sorry. Okay. So Catherine, Catherine's question is, and it looks like Marsha has already answered it, but I'll, um, I'll put it out there for everybody else to, you know, to, to consider. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, Catherine's question is, my friend mailed in a ballot 10 days ago. It was not shown progress. What should I, what should she do? It is not showing post office receiving it. She mailed it in Annandale post office. Marsha's response is try the ballot tracker, um, which is, uh, you know, Marsha provided the, um, the URL for, for, you know, the link for that. Um, and Catherine said she's using the tracker, but when she goes online to track it, it has not shown progress. Seems wrong that it, has been that long, what do you do if a ballot does not show progress? So, um, and then uh, Marsha's response is, uh, she should call the registrar and provide, she provided the number. Now, um, Catherine is, um, 
is your friend in Arlington or are they in, in, in Annadale? Because the number I see here for the registrar is a 228 number, which I believe is an Arlington exchange. And that may not be the right number. I just want to make sure. That is the Arlington registrar, but you can find Annadale, just Google it. Okay. If it's an Arlington voter, um, the, uh, all they have to do is uh, be listed on the on the, the uh, register uh, registered voter list, and then uh, they just sign an affidavit that says they won't vote twice uh, if the uh, ballot does show up. They can see this when they look at their their monitor. When you come in and, and show your identification, they can see whether they've sent you a ballot or not. They know the, that answer. Um, and if the if you should be so uh, mistaken as to try to vote again, it won't work. Only the first yeah. uh, vote counts. Yeah. So that should work in Annandale as well, because it's state procedures that Matt was talking about earlier, I think, right, Matt? Yeah, no, the guidance is the same for every county, um, which is basically what Jill said, which is if you requested a ballot, uh, a mail-in ballot, and you haven't received it yet, but you want to vote in person, you just have to go um, vote in person, sign an affidavit saying you will destroy the ballot once you receive it, and you will not cast the ballot, and you, and you get to vote. So that's how it's done. And I see Alexandra is pulling up the uh, contact information for Fairfax. So it's, it's the same thing. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. Okay, so I think we go to Michael's question. Michael, you've had your hand up for a while. Um, That's fine. That's fine. I, I meant to actually try to jump in. I wanted to add a couple things. Um, one is in terms of if you feel like you've been intimidated, um, I would definitely encourage not just the poll observers to, you know, speak to the chief or uh, file something. The voter should ask to speak to the chief and ask the chief to make a note of it and report it back to the central office or whatever county you're voting in. But in addition, there's also an actual form that the State Board of Election has. And I realize if sending in a form is not going to make a difference, but if in this election, if we get bad behavior and intimidation, I would encourage people to take the moment to, to, to fill out that form and send it to Richmond. Um, and if there's enough of them, that at least documents that, you know, there was some intimidation, people were not feeling comfortable. Um, and every, I think, at least in Arlington, every election officer chief in their bag, they're going to have a stack of those forms just requested. Um, and I was going to uh, just to fill out a little bit um, with what, what Matt Roy was talking about the election officers. So in Arlington, just so everyone knows, we had a tremendous response in terms of people wanting to be um, a poll worker, an election officer. Um, and I'm one of the, um, on the elderly side, poll workers who will be there. Uh, but he, exactly right. A lot of us who are who are uh, have done this and get older with COVID. Um, so just to be clear, to be a um, poll worker, you need to be a registered voter in Virginia, not necessarily in Arlingtonian or not necessarily anywhere else in the in the state. So that's exactly right. There are areas of the state where not they might need poll observers, but also might need election workers. And you can, as a, a registered voter in Virginia work in those counties or cities. So I would encourage people to uh, think about that because at the moment we're definitely full of uh, people who answered the call in, in Arlington. Okay, well, thank you, Michael. Um, did anybody else have any other comments or questions? I don't, um, I see that Alexander has put the, uh, the link in the chat room um, for Fairfax County. So if anybody needs that, I would, I would make sure to, uh, you know, to copy that link. Um, okay. So uh, nobody has any other questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> um, so I was able to figure out the the uh, poll question um, technology. So I'm going to try to bring this one up. And the oh, great. One I don't have on here is uh, the the poll, uh, the voter protection. So I apologize because um, I created this today. So um, let me see if I can relaunch this.
So we're just asking based on what you've heard or what you already know about ways to inform voters about their um, election, about both the candidates and the voting procedures. Um, Alexandra, it appeared and then it disappeared again. Oh, that's weird. Okay, let's try Like that. half a second, really. To, I, I think I clicked on something, but it was. Um, can, we vote, can we select more than one? Yes, you can select more than one. It's multiple choice. Okay. I see we don't have voter protection on there. Um, I know, I, I apologize because I created this right before the, um, the meeting when I was trying to figure out the... I, we, we, um, of course I understand, but, but we really need uh, volunteers to do that. Um, I, you know, I've signed up to do that. I'm, I'm, I, I saw your email. I just haven't had a chance to respond, but I need to uh, take the training, which I believe I have a few more days to, to respond to, uh, to do that. So um, I, I'll be volunteering. So that's, I hope that's helpful. I, I wanted to let, uh, Alexander, I cannot, I'm not able to respond to this poll. Um, and I think it may be because I'm one of the hosts. Um, oh, yeah, that might be. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so anyway, um, yeah, so for those who uh, I can't either, um, so we can just put in the chat um, how we're how we're uh, volunteering. Yeah, I actually well I indicated how I was, and I'm also going to be doing poll greeting too, of course, as a precinct captain. So. So. The Arlington volunteer webpage and fill out what they would like to do. Okay. Yeah, why don't we get, um, give that our URL? Yeah, if you could, if, you, if anybody has that handy yeah, and can just that. sort of put it in the chat box, that would be much appreciated. Great idea. Thank you, Marsha. Okay. So I just wanted to share the results of this poll, and I know it doesn't have every option on here, and not everyone on here was able to join because of the co hosting issue, but gives us some information at least um, about who's already signed up or interested in these different roles. Hmm. So it looks like poll greeting at satellite and early voting, satellite early voting locations and voter registration are the top two. Cool. Okay, so I will stop sharing this and I'm sorry, did someone ask me to pull up a website? I'm, I'm putting in the election volunteering page, which is the most critical right now. So. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I think we, we are kind of uh, we are towards the end, folks. And um, if no one has any more questions or comments or, um, you know, anecdotes, you know, in, in you know, in interesting and relevant anecdotes. Um, I think I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to bring our, our, um, our forum to a close. Awesome. And Just sorry, really quickly before we do that, since we have some people from outside of Arlington on, on our meeting, um, and do, do any of our presenters know, because this is the, uh, obviously the Arlington Dems page, do we know if the Fairfax Democrats have a, a volunteer page? as well? I don't know. You'd have to go look and see. I don't know. Oh, okay. Imagine. I, it. I'm sure they do. Yeah. Okay. Right. I think if, if people just Google Fairfax Democrats volunteers. Well, you know, nobody is quite as- Matt Royer just put it in the chat, so it's there. Oh, okay. okay. Ah, okay. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks Ooh. everybody. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. And I, I, I want to thank, before I close, I want to thank um, all, of, uh, all of my incredible team, uh, Alexandra, uh, Ken. Uh, I don't believe Anika was able to make it tonight. And, uh, and Michael, just, you know, quick jazz hands say, you know, I just want to recognize you guys. You've done an amazing job. And also the speakers. Now it's your turn. I want to thank all of our speakers for um, for being here and providing, you know, such really critical information at a very uh, pivotal point in our country's history. Um, 
Thanks for organizing everyone. Thank you. All right, everyone. Good, Good night. night. Thanks again. Bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Okay. All right. The cone of silence is lifted. <laughs> Um, and this is, oh, I forgot to mention the, um, this is our link for the event feedback form, but we'll, we'll send that out in an email as Fatima said. I'm stopping the recording. <laughs>